For more than 100 years, Australia and the United States have fought side by side as allies, building a relationship we've come to know as the Alliance. In this series, we'll bring you the complete story of our Pacific partnership. We'll explore the cultural, economic and military ties that bring Canberra closer to Washington and the historic links at the heart of our democracies. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the ANZUS Treaty and for many in the Pacific region, it's never been more important. The Australian relationship with the United States is going to become increasingly important with the emergence of China and also because of the broader growth across the whole of Asia. As Asia grows, so too will our reliance on the United States for our security. In episode three, we take a look at how the 20th century witnessed both great highs... LBJ is with Australia all the way. ..and unparalleled lows in the history of our alliance. Plus, how closer collaboration in the field of intelligence has made our nation safer and more secure that's all to come on The Alliance. <laughs> Vietnam, one of the most controversial conflicts ever to involve our armed forces. What started out as a regional fight for independence in French Indochina would end up as the front line of an ideological battle a ferocious Cold War struggle that would have devastating consequences, especially for the Vietnamese people themselves. More than 58,000 Americans and 521 Australians lost their lives in Vietnam. Many more were wounded. And amid the bloodshed, a terrible combination of immense fear and overconfidence would, at times, test the alliance itself. From the outset, our involvement in Vietnam was a deliberate move to contain the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. There's no sense in which Australia was dragged kicking and screaming into Vietnam. Australians pressed the Americans to continue the fight, basically because we wanted the Americans on the mainland of Southeast Asia. And that was going to help us in our policy of forward defence, to keep the threat from Asia as far away as from possible, to prevent the falling dominoes. Communism had already spread in North Vietnam under the leadership of Ho Chi Minh's Viet Cong, a Vietnamese revolutionary. It was his ambition to expel the influence of French colonialism and create a united and independent communist state. The West feared that if Vietnam was to go the way of China and North Korea, then Laos, Cambodia and Thailand would be next. In the 1950s, there had been a communist insurgency in in Malaysia, and in the 60s, there were significant insurgencies in both Thailand and the Philippines. So, rightly or wrongly, it was seen in the United States and in Australia, uh, Vietnam was seen as part of a, a broader challenge. The South Vietnamese government called on support from the United States and its allies to resist the Viet Cong. Initially, Australia responded by sending an elite team of just 30 military advisers to Saigon in 1962. Over the coming decade, our involvement would escalate as the United States stepped up its involvement, committing hundreds of thousands of ground troops to the region. So I think the Vietnam War gave the US-Australia alliance new meaning. We contributed 8,000 troops. Uh, and Australia, along with New Zealand, were the only two US allies to give freely to the cause in Vietnam. So it was, uh, up until quite recently, I think, the high point of alliance intimacy, and Australia was able to use the alliance for national interest purposes. In June 1965, our government sent a battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment to serve side by side with the US 173rd Airborne Brigade Bob Cockrell was only 19 when his unit was deployed to Vietnam in great secrecy. Well, when they decided that we were going to go to Vietnam, it was being denied that we were going to go to Vietnam right up until the death knock. And still, it was not being kept um, confirmed that we were going to Vietnam until we were halfway there. And um, we were told there that we were going to go and join the Yanks. And I was like, oh, so this is going to be a bit different. 
the Yanks were saying, what do you say? And, and the Aussies were there going, what do you say? We couldn't understand each other there because some of the accents in America, down south and that sort of stuff there, they are quite strong. Many veterans remember how accents weren't the only difference. They operated a different way to what the Australians did. Um, and the, uh, you know, one battalion Royal Australian Regiment, they found that out when they were out in the scrub. Although the, the Australian Army, they um, operated a different way when they were out in the bush, and the way they patrolled and, and that sort of thing, compared to the Americans. I mean, my first impression of the, of the Americans was they, they, they trained differently. I mean, we were trained 100% for jungle warfare. But the Americans are also trained for, they might have a, a, a standard warfare in, in Europe or they could be anywhere. So they, they couldn't train to the same level we did in how to fight in jungles. When they went out in the jungle, they on an operation there, they had to have some Australians go out there with them. So when you come behind you know, a group of Viet Cong, that are laying in, in waiting for someone to come up the road, well, <laughs> there, it was on for young and old. So as we handled ourselves, you know, the way we were asked to handle it, we did all right there. So we, I think we earned the respect of the American soldiers, but um, I quite liked them as well. And you could guarantee the Americans really appreciated what we could do and the way we could do it. So quite often we would be sent in to go to an area, there'd be information, intelligence, that there was something there, but nobody knew exactly where. They guaranteed the Australians would find it. And once we found it and it started to get a bit heavy, then they would come in with the numbers and, and fix the problem. The amount of firepower they had and the amount of equipment, I've never seen so many helicopters in my life um, on operations and flying around and the aircraft. We, we were located pretty close to the, the airstrip. There was just a hive of activity on the airstrip. Planes coming and going all the time. And, and I know that they appreciated us and, and I mean, they, they all, every time we talked to the American infantry soldiers, they turned around saying they just, just couldn't believe the things that we would go and do, or were prepared to go and do. One thing they really appreciated from the Australians was the fact Australia paid its own way for everything. If, if the equipment came from America, Australia paid the bill for the equipment, whereas most of the other nations that were in support were being fully funded by uh, the US. Australia's commitment to the fight was appreciated just as much at the top when Harold Holt declared that he was all the way with LBJ. President Johnson made a big effort to reward the Prime Minister. I have never looked forward to any two days in my life with more pleasurable anticipation. You had the first presidential visit to Australia in 1966, um, which was a huge success. Uh, you know, here was the great power protector coming uh, to sort of give its thanks for Australia's con contribution to Vietnam. Look, I think much of that comes down to the political, diplomatic and military support that the Holt administration provided to, to Lyndon Johnson at a difficult time. But the fact that Johnson made the first presidential visit to Australia in 1966, in October, the month before a federal election, the only election really in Australia's history that's been fought on foreign policy, I think shows you uh, the, the, the closeness of that relationship. Similarly, when Harold Holt passed away, uh, Johnson came out for the funeral. So he came at the, in October 66 and in December 1967. So I think that shows you the mark of respect. But the war in Vietnam would take a more sinister turn. No matter how well our diggers could see through the jungle, our political leaders could not always see the wood for the trees. At home in both countries, the war would become increasingly unpopular. Although a failure militarily, the Viet Cong's Tet Offensive in 1968 had a major impact on public opinion. We'd done a good job. I mean, I've been there during Tet of 68, which, you now that was the turning point, really, in Australia and America, of the lack of support from the media at the time. I think in the start it had the support, but as it wore on, the support got less and less. And uh, in the end, you know, the, the diggers coming back didn't want to 
talk about it or where they'd been or what they'd done. A quick example of how bad it was, when, not long after we come home. Uh, when I came home from the first tour, I was a, an instructor at Kapuka, teaching the new guys. And on Anzac Day, we marched in Wagga, in uniform, at the request of the RSL. But when we got to the RSL to go in for drinks and a meal afterwards, we were refused entry in uniform with medals on. Because that just wasn't, no, no, you can't have Vietnam veterans in here. I mean, when you come home and you're told not to wear your uniform, um, that was, that, that hurt. We were ostracised there, you know, and called baby killers and this sort of stuff there, you know, and, and I, we didn't do that. Yeah, I think those pictures of me and the war memorial there with the kids, we were out there trying to help people. I think the, uh, the Vietnam veteran in those days there was used as a pawn there for one political party to get power. Like, I can remember getting spat on by my Australian people. I think it was bad for the governments to take it out on the soldiers. In 1972, the anti-war Labor Party managed to dislodge the coalition from power for the first time since the ANZUS Treaty was signed. Labor's victory meant that Prime Minister Gough Whitlam had to do business with Republican President Richard Nixon. Ideologically opposed, the two men didn't see eye to eye. Those disagreements, I think, came out of a number of areas. Um, concern in Washington that here was the first Labor government in 23 years, a Labor government which didn't support the war in Vietnam. Concern that Whitlam might not be able to ha um, handle the left wing of his party. Um, and let's bear in mind too that the um, Whitlam government was elected at the time that Nixon and Kissinger ordered the famous Christmas or infamous Christmas bombings on Hanoi and Haiphong. And you had senior Labor ministers come out and call the White House murderers, thugs. Um, well, America wasn't used to being treated like this. I mean, almost overnight, Australia had gone from being the most loyal ally to being its most critical. And um, Nixon said that basically Australia was the number two country on his shit list of least favourite countries. Sweden was number one, Australia was number two. Relations between President and Prime Minister worsened as the Nixon White House made major foreign policy decisions without consulting its close ally. What Australia found is that the intimacy they thought they had secured by their military contribution didn't necessarily translate into the sort of consultation that they wanted. With defeat in Vietnam, the United States signalled that it was withdrawing from Southeast Asia. So towards the end of the war, this alliance is not um, there are question marks over just how close these two allies really are. For the first time, the alliance itself was under threat. I mean, basically, the Nixon-Whitlam period is the closest this country has ever come to losing that alliance. I mean, not long before he left office uh, in the disgrace of Watergate, Richard Nixon ordered all the national security agencies in Washington to do a thorough review of the alliance. And the kinds of recommendations that were proposed were cutting off intelligence, stopping military training exercises between the two militaries, and potentially relocating the intelligence installations out of Australia. Now, had they been followed through on, the Alliance would have been left as little more than a fairly brittle chrysalis. There wouldn't have been much left to it. So yeah, this is the lowest period, the closest it ever came, I think, to kind of breaking apart. But um, it was repaired. I think the Fraser government certainly patched things up. Um, the very first meeting that Fraser has with, um, with Gerald Ford in the Oval Office in mid-1976, Gerald Ford says, it's very good we've got rid of the vestiges of those differences that we had with your country. How did the Vietnam War shape the alliance and our relations with the United States? And did it test the alliance? Uh, I think it strengthened the alliance. Um, there were, uh, uh, you know, there were challenges uh, uh, for the Alliance during their period of Prime Minister Whitlam, but I think they were challenges. I doubt whether the Alliance was 
threatened. To what extent is the Alliance vulnerable to or defined by the leaders of the time? Both countries have made sure that the Alliance is not defined by the personality of their leaders or the relationship between their leaders. The relationship between the US uh, President and the Australian Prime Minister is very, very important. And on specific issues, it can be critical. But in terms of the alliance, in overall terms, I, I, think, we've, I think we've managed it uh, beyond that point. The instability of the Vietnam era taught us some valuable lessons about managing the alliance partnership. Far from being all the way with the USA, Australia would become more self-reliant and take a more pragmatic and considered approach, something that ultimately the ally would respect. The most important point actually to come out of um, that period of tension in the 1970s was that you had senior American diplomats like Marshall Green saying, you know what, this is actually a better, healthier relationship because Australia can disagree with us. And that shows maturity. And, you know, we're welcoming the expression of a more nationalist Australia. Um, we don't always agree with it, but it shows that Australia has an independence of mind. Coming up, we look at how our intelligence partnership has strengthened our security and widened the scope of the alliance. The 1980s and the election of Bob Hawke's Labor Party in 1983 ushered in a new era in Australian politics. The Australians now had two hands on the America's Cup. The white boat hit the finish line 41 seconds in front. I tell you what, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up to die is a bum. <laughs> Hawke's charismatic and competitive personality gave our relationship with the United States a new dimension, and not only when it came to the America's Cup. So I think Bob Hawke, as he was coming into office, knew that the Labor Party had a bit of a credibility problem on the US alliance that was a hangover from the Whitlam years. The CIA documents show that they were somewhat troubled by Hawke's trade union background. So there were, there were ripples of concern about Labor coming into office. Now, Hawke, I think, was aware of this. He knew that he had to control the left wing of the party with, with a tighter rein, I think, than what Whitlam had been able to do. So his first act in terms of the alliance in, in coming into office is to, and it was an election promise, is to institute a review of, of Australia's relationship with the United States. The review was, of course, it concluded that the relationship obviously should be kept and maintained, that it should be further developed. But I think the, the key point about it was that Hawke used it as well to carve out space for more independence within the alliance, right? When he goes to Washington in 1983 on his first visit there, he says Australia and America will be together forever. Well, I'm delighted that Prime Minister Bob Hawke has been able to come to Washington so early in his administration. Bob Hawke, as Prime Minister in the 1980s, put ANZUS under review. Can you give us a sense of what the thinking was around that time, why he, why he did that and what, if any, impact there was in the medium well, to longer term? My own personal view is that I think the Hawke government played a critical role uh, in ensuring broad bipartisan support for the Alliance. He got on very well with both Reagan and with Bush Senior. You might recall that um, Kim Beasley, who's now the governor of Western Australia, he played an important role as defence minister. You look at the statements made by the Hawke government about the joint facility at Pine Gap. That had been a controversial issue within the Labor Party. And uh, the Hawke government addressed that. It was the Hawke government that initiated the Osment meetings. Uh, they did that uh, to give a platform and base to the Alliance to put on an annual regular footing um, 
uh, a platform for discussion at the highest levels uh, between the US and Australia. So they added a steadiness uh, to the alliance, which I think has continued through to today. A joint meeting between the key secretaries and ministers overseeing defence and foreign affairs, Osmin continues to this day. Kim Beasley was the first defence minister to attend Osmin and sees how ANZUS has been built upon significantly. And so ANZUS provided the rubric for the really important treaties. And the really important treaties were those which governed the operations of the Northwest Cape uh, radio facility, uh, the Pine Gap uh, uh, intelligence gathering base, the Narunga early warning system, and a whole range of, of smaller uh, agreements underneath them. And those have been more recently joined by some really important treaties related to space-based issues. So you've got a, uh, these things terribly important to Australia's defence, enormously important to the United States. Pine Gap is there, the biggest intelligence base the United States has. So you've got to act, the real American alliance, the guts of it, is all around that, those agreements. Pine Gap is a hugely important facility uh, that allows Australia and the United States uh, to gain better information about any potential threats to the security of our nations. Now, uh, the importance of Pine Gap is, is a genuine joint facility. The Australian relationship with the United States is going to become increasingly important with the emergence now, and also because of the broader growth story in, uh, across the whole of Asia. Uh, as Asia grows, so too will our reliance on the United States for our security. It's a very close relationship. I think the, the intelligence that's shared between Australia and the United States um, is significant in, in, in you know, two way. I think there's a great respect in the American system for Australia's knowledge of Southeast Asia in particular, and especially Indonesia. Uh, and there's no doubt, I think, that that is part of this alliance relationship which, which gives Australia a kind of a, a position or a status in world affairs that, that otherwise it might not normally be able to attain. Joint security is right at the heart of our partnership with the United States and even predates the official signing of the ANZUS Treaty. It's here that we've built an intelligence partnership that has widened out to include our key allies from World War II. Well, it's interesting because Five Eyes has grown from being something derived from the signals intelligence arrangement, the secret, secret intelligence arrangement that emerged from the Second World War between Britain and the United States that then included Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, this was for decades a highly secret concept. The idea of Five Eyes uh, it itself is derived from this idea of releasable to Australian, UK, US, New Zealand, Canadian eyes only. So five countries' eyes only. And if you, you shorten that down to five eyes, so that's you know for intelligence practitioners and people in the in the policy world that are privy to classified documents, this idea of five eyes has been a long-standing one. But in the intelligence domain, I would say Australia has deeper and more significant ties to the United States uh, than even Britain and certainly much more so than Canada or New Zealand. Even though I'd been Treasurer of Australia, been in Parliament for nearly 20 years, Minister for a long time, I never really understood how significant the intelligence relationship is between the United States and Australia until I became Ambassador. And in that role, you see almost everything. Uh, and the Five Eyes is the most powerful intelligence partnership in the world. There's no doubt about it. It covers all corners of the earth and we share to different degrees uh, classified information that can save the lives of our citizens and those in other countries. Uh, without that intelligence sharing relationship, 
Many attempted terrorist attacks in Australia would have been successful. There's no doubt in my mind. And whilst it's founded out of shared intelligence and network, uh, it's becoming more and more significant in a number of areas. Uh, in space, uh, you can see more and more interactivity between suppliers in Australia and New Zealand, a number of others, uh, with US activities in space. Uh, in supply chains, whether it be in critical minerals or in excluding uh, Huawei from 5G networks, you can see that, that now the intelligence relationship is becoming much broader and is stepping right into commercial relationships as well between all of our countries. There are those who aren't as comfortable with where Five Eyes is headed. Not for the first time, New Zealand is pushing back on certain elements of the security partnership. In the 1980s, New Zealand felt uncomfortable with allowing nuclear-powered vessels to find safe harbour in its waters. In backing out of the Alliance partnership, relations between New Zealand and the United States suffered. Well, I think New Zealand United States relations um, are still in some ways recovering from that episode. Um, things are certainly better there. Um, but essentially that came about because of the decision by the New Zealand Prime Minister David Longy to not allow um, nuclear-powered vessels into New Zealand ports. There was, I think, a lot of pressure from the Americans on Australia to also isolate New Zealand. Australia didn't do it. Australia continued to share intelligence with New Zealand. And even though the NZ dropped out of ANZUS, the Australian government of Bob Hawke kept referring to ANZUS. So there was a sense in which I think Australia didn't want to cut New Zealand adrift in that period. But certainly for the Americans, I mean, there's a very clear decision taken by the Reagan administration that so far as they are concerned, New Zealand is out of it, basically. I mean, there's not a, there's not a tearing up of the treaty, um, you know, in, in front of New Zealand Parliament House or the New Zealand Embassy in Washington. But, but they, are, they are cut out of the loop. There's no question of that. But what's happened is that the United States has said that it feels no obligation now to carry out what it calls its security guarantee to New Zealand. Prime Minister David Longy uh, didn't really see the need to continue investing in the relationship with the United States. And because of the domestic dynamics inside New Zealand, uh, New Zealand politics, that meant that it was kind of convenient for him politically to uh, push away from the United States. Not, I think, realising quite how significant a reaction he would get from the United States. Of course, that made it quite difficult for Australia. Uh, and I'm a, as a former intelligence practitioner, I'm acutely conscious of how difficult it was for Australia to keep a positive and constructive relationship with New Zealand going while separating out uh, US-derived intelligence, given that we're so intimately connected on the intelligence fronts with the United States. Uh, so it actually made extra work for Australia uh, to manage the two relationships and air gap the two. Um, uh, over time, however, we managed to get over it in the late 90s, particularly over in Bougainville and then in East Timor. Australia and New Zealand worked intimately together alongside the United States as well, eventually. What impact did that have on the broader Australia-US relationship, if any? It, uh, it's, it certainly uh, was a challenge, but I think the Hawke government was determined not to allow decisions taken in Wellington to, uh, to determine uh, uh, its own relationship with, uh, with Washington. And uh, I think Hawke Hawk played that very well. He maintained a respectful relationship with the New Zealanders and a defence tie there. Uh, New Zealand, interestingly enough, the Americans did not completely turn their back on the New Zealanders. Uh, the heads of intelligence agencies meetings uh, at that time continued with New Zealand. Um, and the, uh, the, so the Americans, if you like, punished New Zealand up to a point, but did not abandon the relationship. Once again in 2021, New Zealand has signalled it's not entirely comfortable with aspects of its security arrangement with the United States. The Ardern government has criticised how Five Eyes is expanding. The 
uh, Five Eyes arrangement is about a security and intelligence framework. And it's not necessary all the time on every issue to invoke Five Eyes as your first port of call in terms of creating a coalition uh, of uh, support around particular issues in the human rights space, for example. Now, this idea of it broadening out to being a body that is represents a broader policy consensus on a range of security and trade and economic interests uh, is is new ground. Uh, so I don't, I'm not surprised that it's contested. But in light of the changed geostrategic dynamics of greater great power contestation and the more adversarial relationship between uh, China and the rest of us, really, um, it's not surprising that there's growing demand for that uh, closer coordination on a range of fronts. I must say I'm probably a bit concerned in the way in which the Five Eyes is transforming itself from a intelligence relationship into something that appears to be more. I mean, we now have the, the finance ministers of the Five Eyes meeting. Um, now, I don't doubt that there are issues of a significant nature that demand consultation and cooperation between these five countries, but I think the moment you start enforcing some kind of unanimity of view on some of these policy questions, then you're going to run into trouble like what we've seen with New Zealand and China. New Zealand needs to be very careful because a relationship can't be based on uh, overwhelmingly just one party taking from everyone else. You need to give in order to maintain a relationship. And whilst New Zealand is at times fiercely independent, nothing wrong with that, they've also got to be mindful that they uh, spend very little on the defence of their nation and uh, or either from a military perspective or an intelligence perspective compared to others. So we can't be, a, we can't be four eyes or four and a half eyes. And so New Zealand needs to lift. One of your successes as ambassador, Joe Hockey, yes. has described five eyes as more like four and a half eyes because New Zealand doesn't really carry its weight. Is, is that fair in your view? I think it's a little bit unfair. I think... Uh... And New Zealand is a country of five million people. Uh, it sees its strategic circumstances differently to us. Um, it, uh, it does make a contribution uh, to the Five Eyes community in the Pacific and also sometimes beyond. I mean, let's not forget the... Uh, the, the uh, New Zealand actually provided assistance uh, to the United States uh, at the time of the Iranian uh, conflict in 78, 79. All the attention was there on the Canadians and, uh, and, and the movie that played that uh, uh, presented New Zealand in a negative light. But in fact, New Zealand helped, uh, helped the United States in that context. And I think to talk about uh, four eyes and a blink to talk about uh, four and a half, I think, is being disrespectful uh, to a country with which we have the closest of relationships, in which we should. I very strongly believe in the five eyes as a group of nations. They provide us with a unparalleled capability uh, to help uh, inform the world uh, about what's going on in the world and New Zealand is a very much a part of that. Now, whether New Zealand wants to be part of every aspect of ANZUS, they've proved before that they don't, uh, and that's their sovereign choice. But Five Eyes is a very important capability. In Washington, Arthur Sinodinas is the current custodian of the relationship and is very comfortable working with our New Zealand allies. I know New Zealand have said certain things about what statements they want to be part of with the Five Eyes, but if you read the latest speech by the New Zealand Foreign Minister, she made it very clear with her criticisms of China and human rights in certain areas that they're not derogating from that 
It's just about the context in which they make those statements. What I find dealing with New Zealand here in Washington is that they're very strongly committed to the Five Eyes relationship. They get great value out of it, as we do, and we put a lot of stuff into it, as they do. So the Five Eyes relationship is strong, and I think it's getting stronger. And in fact, what I find interesting is that people start to speculate about whether the Five Eyes become the Six Eyes or the Seven Eyes. But look, the Five Eyes is what it is now. And uh, my point is simply that it's seen as vibrant and strong and very valuable. So valuable that other countries are looking to build their own partnerships in order to realise a similar capability. It's no surprise that a number of the ASEAN nations are trying to replicate the Five Eyes with what they're calling Our Eyes, which Australia is helping to uh, train and support our eyes, uh, which is Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia and other countries, because that capability to be able to view what's going on in the world, uh, to provide that significant intelligence capability is helping to keep the world safe. And the New Zealanders are very much part of that. Coming up, how the economic partnership has been built upon to create jobs, growth and prosperity. From World War I to Vietnam and the more recent conflicts like Afghanistan, most Australians are aware of the military relationship with the United States. But what is perhaps less well known is that military partnership underpins an extraordinary economic relationship, both in terms of trade and investment. There are some American companies that have been operating in Australia for more than 100 years, companies like GE that came into Australia in the 19th century and are still here today, and then a lot of newer companies as well. But it's a very busy two-way street. There are a lot of Australian companies that are operating in the United States now as well, and the two-way trade and investment relationship is worth almost $2 trillion which is very, very significant for both countries. Australia punches well above its weight with the US investing over a trillion dollars here in Australia. April Parmalee is the CEO of the American Chamber of Commerce here in Australia. This year, AmCham celebrates a major milestone. We're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year, and we have offices all across the country that support the bilateral trade and investment relationship between our countries. We were set up to explore the opportunities and create dialogue and discussion. And we've been growing ever since um, being set up originally in Sydney in 1961. The post-war boom meant that it was a good time to set up shop. The real growth of American businesses in Australia, I think, started after the Second World War because of the collaboration between Australia and the United States after the fall of Singapore, there was a lot of military um, investment in the, um, and the technology here in the products that Australia had after the war. And so I think that was really the beginning of a very fruitful relationship economically, but based on the military relationship. Uh, there are companies like Boeing that have their biggest footprint outside the United States here in Australia. So those are are the anchors of the American business community here in Australia. There are some members who joined with us in 1961 who are still with us today. American Express, Merck, Caterpillar. We've had some companies with us for a very, very long time. IBM, Bechtel, Coca-Cola, Baker McKenzie. Founded in Chicago in 1949, Baker McKenzie has operated in Australia for more than half a century. Well, Baker McKenzie is a global law firm, one of the largest law firms in the world, and we've been doing business in Australia since 1964, just soon after AmCham itself started here. Uh, our business was founded just after World War II, and we were following US capital into Europe. And it wasn't very long after that we started to follow US capital into Asia. And indeed, uh, our Sydney office is the second office that we opened in the region. And we've uh, been able to enjoy the opportunity to uh, work beside many great US companies in a whole different wave of investment. 
uh, mining and resources in the 60s, healthcare and consumer good in the 70s, uh, technology in the 80s and 90s, and roll that forward now, and uh, infrastructure, energy transition, and certainly the digital economy and digital disruption um, has been a big part of what we do here, um, particularly as US capital finds its way into this market. And uh, as a consequence of doing that, we've, um, we've really come to understand, I think, the business models and the needs of, of, of foreign capital coming into the market. Um, and others, we're sort of proud to say, have followed us. Uh, but we've been somewhat of a trailblazer in ensuring that our professional services and business here is serviced by that kind of global perspective in law. And we think they're very important contributions to this market. From McDonald's to Google, many American companies have arrived and thrived in Australia, and that means jobs. Yes, well, of course, um, at different phases in the boom and bust cycle of the energy sector, there are fewer or more jobs. But right now, we calculate there are uh, between 300 and 400,000 people working for American companies here in Australia, and their median annual income is $115,000 a year. So that's almost double the average Australian salary. They're, they're very well-paid jobs and they're creating um, opportunities for Australians here in Australia. But with that American investment, American ingenuity and the connection to the American market. AmCham has played a very important and vital role. I mean, it's been a forum for the exchange of ideas and the development of understanding um, between government and business, which has been critical, I think, to the kind of growth that we have enjoyed between Australia and the US. Uh, it's a place that provides terrific resources for those looking to do business here or in the US. Uh, it provides great access to government and to markets. And it really does a terrific job of assiduously developing networks, I mean, trade missions, for example. I mean, I would say that the relationship that is enjoyed uh, from a business perspective between Australia and the US has been very valuable to both our countries. And I think the role that AmCham has played in help facilitate that um, has been vital. And I expect they'll continue to, to contribute to that growth. For 70 years, 3M has been contributing to the investment and growth story. The American multinational entered the Australian market in September 1951 and even shares its anniversary with the ANZUS Treaty itself, almost to the very day. We have helped Australians build the cities where we live, with our tapes, with our respirators or personal protective equipment. That's part of every manufacturing that we see in Australia. From humble beginnings as the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, 3M has gone on to become a major conglomerate. Today, the name 3M is almost a permanent feature on the Fortune 500 list. Not only that, we commercialize more than 60,000 products that are used in everyday lives, from home to offices, from manufacturing, from hospitals to dentists. Our 3M products are everywhere. Here in Australia, that translates into jobs. The company has supported many, many jobs in Australia. And as an example of that, is we started with a very humble operation with only three individuals. And today, we are a very large organization with over 600 uh, individuals. We have, throughout our 70-year journey, employee from technical, research and development, supply chain, manufacturing, sales, marketing, customer service, and many more. In uh, the spirit of collaboration and communication in 3M is very strong. And we call ourselves 3Mers. And we feel that in Australia and New Zealand, we are a very large family. Employing generations of Australians, 3M is Gary and Rebecca Wattsford really are family. Oh, it's been fantastic. I mean, Dad started working at 3M before I was born. So I've grown up, you know, sitting around the kitchen table listening to stories of the people, the places, the products. I've learnt so much. The experience has been absolutely terrific. Um, I wouldn't swap it. <laughs> so, you know, it's great to have my daughter 
working in 3M. I think she's learned a few little things along the way from me, but now I learn from her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's a, been a terrific company for, to work for overall. His bedroom's full of these as well, with all his artwork that he's created for me. <laughs> along the years, I've always been asked, oh, where do you work? And I'll say 3M, and, and sometimes I get a puzzled look, and then I say, oh, post-it notes, command hooks, scotch tape, and, and the light bulb comes on, and they say, oh, oh, wow, oh, that's all 3M, is it? So I think it's those sub-brands that also have such a big recognition in the marketplace as well. Whilst a big American company, 3M Australia has managed to cultivate a fusion with our own Aussie culture. There's definitely that American influence in, in um, the way we do business probably sometimes. I think um, the markets are quite similar. Uh, we definitely have customers that I work with that have sort of sister companies in America, um, a Home Depot, Bunnings, those, that type of relationships. But also I think we have our own Australian culture that we bring and I think that's valued as well as part of the whole world culture. I think um, the way we do business is definitely dip, probably a little bit different to the way the US, our US colleagues, um, and they, they appreciate that. And the support we get from them, um, you know, weekly we're in, in online meetings with the US team and I think, yeah, that, there's that support always. I think the Americans are great. Um, yeah, I've been over to our head office in St Paul probably seven times. I've worked in many states through the US so not only um, in head office, but conferences and customer visits and all that sort of thing. But I, look, the guys I find are, are very much like us. Um, they want to do the best job they can. They're very focused on their customers, as we are. Um, and, you know, more, I think they're very um, supportive of Australia uh, and me as an individual. They have been. Hospitality is second to none. I see you know, great similarities between Australia and, and uh, America in, 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 the way we, in the way we work in 3M. Job satisfaction goes a long way at the 3M manufacturing site in Sydney's Guildford. I love to work with the people, make me feel like family, make me feel happy to work with 3M and I learn a lot, like every day. Oh, I like work at uh, 3M because um, we have the team environment, a culture. Probably what I enjoy the most about 3M working here is uh, a bit of collaboration between my department, which is the warehouse, and also the factory, uh, where we all sort of have the same vision and, and focus and, and the goals. Uh, also, I like the work-life balance factor that love 3 m brings, uh, flexibility, uh, plenty of sick leave, and also some, some of the initiatives that 3M brings. Uh, Example, eh and uh, recognition program they use. They also just brought in the everyday wins. Just in general, I just like how 3M, no matter how small or how big you are, you feel like you're still part of the big team. It is very significant that 3M has been in Australia for 70 years. It's a long time for a company to be here and a long time for a company to be innovating. I've been amazed by all of the things that they provide to Australian industry, to our defence sector, as well as their consumer-facing products. So they are one that has been investing in and innovating and doing research and development here and creating more possibilities for Australians in Australia. At 3M, we continue to invest in science. We continue to invest in innovation. And we are passionate about how we, 3M, are going to help science to solve some of the problems that society will confront in the near future. I believe the best is yet to come, and we continue to apply science to all what we do. The people to people and business to business links between Australia and the United States are enormous. If there are sensitivities ever on a political or military sense, there is still that economic foundation underpinning the alliance. Next time on The Alliance, how America's darkest day changed the world forever. The Alliance invoked as Australia steps up to support its ally. We were right to go in 20 years ago. We were right back in 2005 to send some special forces back. And how things could go so wrong. That's all to come on The Alliance.